Good evening, good evening everyone, good evening. <clears throat> I welcome you all again to VJ Enthuse. I hope all of you are doing great, having a good time. So people, just let me know in the chats first of all if I'm audible and visible to everyone. Hello Vijay, hello VPR, hello Ashwarya, hi Yuvashri, hello Aisha, hi Nandini. Welcome back everyone, welcome back. Just let me know in the chats, give me some green signal from the chat so that I'll get to know that I'm audible and visible to you properly. Yes. Hello Hima Priya, hello Selva, hello Kaunan. Just give me a second, I'll fix the things and we'll start, yeah? Hello Panusi. Hi Akash, I'm doing great, how are you? Hello Tarsana. Hello Modern. Hi Balaji. So welcome back everyone, welcome back as you all must be knowing. Tonight we are going to do the mock test for the class 12 CBSC right from the chemistry part okay perfect so before starting the session the ones who have just joined in the ones who are near the channel let me first of all introduce myself well people my name is Wasim Bhatt and I'm your chemistry master teacher writer on this VJ Enthu channel right well the ones who have not liked the video yet please do like the video share the video with your friends do subscribe to the channel and do not forget to hit the bell icon so that you get the notification of every single session which we take live on this VJ Enthu channel, right? So do like the video, share the video with your friends and do subscribe to the channel as well, okay? So first of all, you guys can let me know in the chats if you all are super duper excited for the CBSC term one mock test, right? Let me know in the chats, my dear people, if you all are super duper excited for the tonight session, yes? How many questions are there? There will be around 30 questions. 25 to 30 questions will be there. So people, are you super duper excited? Are you ready for it? You guys can let me know in the chats first. Well, the Josh is high, it seems, yeah? <clears throat> that is perfect. That's perfect. All right then, so let's get going. Let's get started with the first question, which is going to be on your screen in three, two, one, and now. This is the first question, right, which is from section A. Which of the following is a non-stoichiometric defect? Can you guys let me know in the chats what do you think about this question? A very simple and basic question from the chapter solid state, right? Which of the following is the example of the non-stoichiometric defect? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Well, I can see majority of the students, majority of the people are coming up with option C. And let me tell you, all of you are perfectly correct. It's absolutely going to be option C only, correct? If you remember, in general, if I talk about defects, if I talk about defects, right? First type of defect is going to be the stoichiometric defect in which the stoichiometry remains unchanged. Second defect is called as non-stoichiometric defect. And the third defect is what we call as impurity defect. I hope you all now studied this, right? Third one is called as impurity defect, right? Further, if I talk about the stoichiometric defects, there are two types of defects in uh, stoichiometric one. One is going to be short key. One is going to be the short key defect. One is called as the Frankel defect, right? Frankel defect, okay? Similarly, non, in non-stoichiometric defects, what do we have? We have got metal ex excess and metal deficiency. We have got metal excess defect coming in non-stoichiometric and we have got metal deficiency coming in non-stoichiometric defect, right? So just remember this chart. From this chart, you can easily classify which one is the stoichiometric and which one is the non-stoichiometric, right? So your metal deficiency defect is the example of the non-stoichiometric defect, which is coming over here, right? I'm sure it's clear to everyone. Moving on to the second question. Moving on to the second question. During dehydration of alcohols to alkenes by heating with concentrated H2SO4, the initiation step is, what do you guys think about this one? Again, a very simple question, okay? When we do the dehydration of alcohol to alkene by heating with concentrated H2SO4, the initiation step is. Which one is the initiation step? What do you guys think about this one? 
Well, I can see again, majority of the students are coming up with the right answer. It's absolutely going to be the protonation of alcohol molecule, right? If you remember, if I take one alcohol over here, right, CH3, CH2, OH, correct? This is the alcohol, okay? In presence of what? In presence of acid, H2SO4, and giving some heat, what is going to happen first of all? Since this oxygen, it contains two lone pair of electrons, right? So this lone pair is going to get H positive from here, right? When this lone pair gets H positive from here, so what do I get over here? It gets, uh, it gets converted into CH3, CH2, this becomes OH2, oxygen with a positive charge, and there'll be still one lone pair with this oxygen, right? Later on, what happens? This OH2 positive, it's a better leaving group, I must say, right? So this bond breaks in this direction, then what happens? You get the carbocation formation, which is CH3, this is CH2, and there's a positive charge on this carbon, right? After this, at the end, since you're going to form the alkene, so what you'll be doing, you'll be taking the H positive out from here. When you take H positive out, you'll be putting a double bond right here. Finally, you're going to get CH2, double bond CH2. So which one is the chain, I mean, which one is the initiation step? The first one, the protonation of alcohol, protonation of alcohol, it is going to be the initiation step, right? Yes, I'm sure it is clear to every single guy. Moving on to one more. I'm sure this is clear to everyone, right? So first of all, you have got alcohol, you're doing its protonation, which is the initiation stuff. First of all, you get the protonated alcohol, then H2O leaves at the end. What do we get? You get alkene. Okay, amorphous solids are, again, a very simple question. You guys are going to let me know its answer. Amorphous solids are, are these isotropic? Are these anisotropic? Yes, are these isotopic? Are these isomeric? Right, what is going to be the answer of this one? Again, a very simple memory-based question, right? Well, as you all must be knowing, amorphous solids, these are isotropic in nature, right? These are isotropic in nature. Whenever in amorphous solid, you try to calculate the value of any physical property, let me tell you, the value of physical property does not change on changing the direction in case of amorphous solids. And if the value of physical property does not change on changing the direction, we call that sort of property as uh, isotropic right and these are basically your amorphous solids which actually show this property so it's absolutely going to be option one which is going to be the answer of the question right your amorphous solids these are isotropic if i talk about the crystalline ones crystalline solids are n isotropic in nature right simple perfect okay moving on to one more identify the law which is stated as for any solution the partial vapor pressure of each volatile component in the solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction. People, what do you think about this one? Again, a simple equation from the chapter solution. Every one of you must be knowing this, right? Which law is it? Is it the Rolle's law, right? This is the simplest statement of the Rolle's law. For any solution, the partial vapor pressure of each volatile component in the solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction, right? More the mole fraction of the component in the solution phase, more to be, more is going to be its partial pressure more is going to be its contribution towards the total vapor pressure of the solution. As simple as that. This is the simplest statement of what? This is the simplest statement of the Rolle's law. So as you all are saying, absolutely it's option two, which is going to be the correct answer of the equation, right? Okay, what do you think about this one? Which of the following reactions is used to prepare salicylaldehyde? It's a very common reaction. From which reaction do we prepare salicylaldehyde, my dear people? Fast. Fast, fast, fast. Absolutely, it's going to be the rimer timon reaction. In the rimer timon reaction, what do we get as the product? We get the product as salicylaldehyde, right? Yes, right? This is the reaction. You start with the phenol. In presence of CHCl3 and KOH, what do you get? You get salicylaldehyde as the product, right? Okay. In place of CHCl3, if you will use CCl4, what do you get the product at that time? Let me know first. If instead of this CHCl3, you'll be using CCl4, what is the product which you'll be getting at that point of time? Is it still going to be salicylaldehyde or it's going to be salicylic acid? Let me know. I'm asking you. It is simple, right? See, you're starting with phenol, right? You're making it to react with CHCl3 in presence of KOH, right? You get salicylaldehyde as the product right here. 
But people, let me tell you, if you'll be replacing the CHCl3, and in place of this CHCl3, if you'll place CCl4, then you won't be getting salicylic acid, you'll be getting salicylic acid. So instead of this CHO group, you get COOH group. Instead of this CHO group, you get COOH group. Right? Do remember this thing as well. Perfect. Which of the following is an example of the solid solution? A very simple and basic question. Let me know its answer fast in the chats. I'm looking at your chats only. Which of the following is an example of a solid solution? Solid solution. Where do you see solid in solid? Where do you see solid in solid? Is it going to be the 22 karat gold? Absolutely. All of you are perfectly correct. It's option D. It is absolutely going to be 22 karat gold, where, which is basically an alloy of gold and other metals like zinc, silver, copper, etc. This, thus, it is an example of a solid in solid solution, right? A simple question, basic question this is. Correct? And I'm sure all of you must be knowing its answer. Yeah? And majority of the students I can see have given the correct answer only. Wonderful. The boiling points of alcohols are higher than that of hydrocarbons of comparable masses. Due to what? Due to hydrogen bonding? Due to ion dipole interaction? Due to dipole dipole interaction? Due to Van der Waals forces? What is going to be the answer of this one? Why are the boiling points of alcohols higher than that of hydrocarbons having comparable masses? Because in alcohols, I must say hydrogen bonding is present, due to which its boiling point will be definitely more than that of more than that of the hydrocarbons with comparable masses, right? So what is going to be the correct answer of this question? It's absolutely going to be hydrogen bonding, which by means of which the boiling point of alcohols will be higher than that of the uh, hydrocarbons having the comparable masses. So option one is absolutely the correct answer. Majority of the students have given the correct one. Absolutely good, guys. Wonderful. Exactly. Hydrogen bonding. Yeah. They form intermolecular hydrogen bonding, right? Due to basically intermolecular hydrogen bonding, the boiling point of alcohols will be more. Okay. Which of the following has the lowest boiling point? What do you think about this one? Again, a very simple question. You are given with the hydrides of group 16, right? You are given with the hydrides of group, group, of group 16. Which of the following has the lowest boiling point? Well, I can see option D and option B coming up. So who to believe? I'll wait for some time. Let me know. Give it a thought. Give it a thought. If you talk about the hydrides of group 16 elements, you started from H2. Then you write H2S. What do we have next? H2SC. What do we have next? H2TE. Then what do we have next? H2PO. Correct? These are the hydrides of group 16. Generally, what happens? What happens on moving from top to bottom? Generally, are we talking about boiling point? Okay. Boiling point generally increases on moving from top to bottom, right? Boiling point increases on moving from top to bottom. Okay. But in case of water due to hydrogen bonding, in case of water due to hydrogen bonding, the boiling point will be maximum, right? In case of water due to hydrogen bonding, the boiling point is maximum. And we know on moving from top to bottom, the boiling point increases. So I'll say the highest boiling point will be for uh, water. Then comes this, then comes this, then comes this. And at the end, there'll be H2S. So H2S is the one which is going to have the least boiling point among all, right? So how many students have given the correct answer? Well, I can see majority of the students have given the correct answer. Perfectly done, right? Okay, moving on to one more. Pink color of LICL crystal is due to. Color in the crystal is due to is due to. What do you think about this? Fast. Give it a thought. Color in the crystal is due to what? Is it due to the presence of F center? Right? It is due to the presence of F center where F stands for far away. Right? Far away means color. Right? And that F center is created in which kind of defect? Is it Frankel defect or metal excess defect or metal Lipschitz defect? What do you think? It's absolutely going to be the metal excess defect. Right? Absolutely it's going to be the metal excess defect. In case of metal excess defect, uh, F centers are created due to which color is induced in the crystal, right? So option C, as majority of the students said, option D is the one which is going to be the correct among all. A simple and common question this was based on the F center. Okay, Williamson synthesis of preparing dimethyl ether is an, is it SN1 reaction? Is it elimination reaction? Is it SN2 reaction or nucleophilic addition reaction in general? What do you think about this one? You guys can solve this one as well. It's a very common reaction, guys. Williamson synthesis. Right? In which ethers are prepared. Is it SN1 or SN2? Is it SN1 or SN2?
Again, majority of the students have come up with the correct answer. It's absolutely going to be the SN2 reaction. Absolutely, guys. It is SN2 reaction. You start with the alkoxide, sodium alkoxide. You make it to react with the alkyl halide, right? And what do you get as the end? You get ether as a product, right? Simply, you are going to take this NAR out. Sorry. You are going to take this NAX out and you are going to make the product as ROR, right? Take this NAX out. ROR is going to be the product, which is basically your ether. This is the simplest reaction which is basically given in your text textbook as well, yeah? Chlorine water loses its yellow color on standing because if I'll be starting with the chlorine water, chlorine water, that means Cl2 gas plus H2O liquid, right? If I'll keep it on the standing mode, what is going to happen? It loses its color, right? And why is that? Why is that? Do you know the reason? Well, 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 I can see a lot of people are giving the correct answer. That's wonderful, guys. You know all this, yeah? Perfectly done. You have studied NCRT to the max side, I think. Absolutely, guys. It's absolutely going to be your option two. Right? So, when you talk about the chlorine, chlorine water, if I start with Cl2 plus H2O liquid, if I'll keep it on the standing mode, what do I get as a product? You get HCl, and with this HCl aqueous, you get HOCl as well, right? Sorry, this is HCl gas, and with this, you get HOCl aqueous as well. These are going to be the products of this reaction, right? So, which, which one satisfies it? Chlorine water loses its yellow color on standing because a mixture of HOCl and HCl is produced in presence of light, yeah? Right? Majority of the students are given already the correct answer. That's wonderful. Okay. Covalency of nitrogen is restricted to... What is the maximum covalency of nitrogen, my dear people, fast? A very simple question. Yes, yes, exactly. Bo uh, NCRT is enough for your boards. Even for J mains. Maximum covalency of nitrogen. Nitrogen cannot exceed its covalency beyond 4. Right? because of the inavailability of d orbitals. I hope you know that, right? The maximum covalency of nitrogen is going to be 4. It cannot exceed its covalency beyond 4. Why is that? Because of the inavailability of d orbitals. So absolutely all of you are perfectly correct. It's going to be option C, which is 4, right? Okay. Solubility of gases and liquids decreases with the rise in temperature because dissolution is an example of Dissolution is an example of endothermic and reversible, exothermic and reversible, endothermic and irreversible, exothermic and irreversible process. What do you guys think about this one? This is again a very simple question. First of all, if you talk about the dissolution of gas in a liquid, right? Dissolution of a gas in a liquid. It is an exothermic process, right? And it is reversible at the same time. If I talk about the gas plus liquid, gas plus liquid, in equilibrium with the solution. This is the solution which you get, right? So delta H for this process is basically negative. It is the exothermic process, right? It is the exothermic process. That is why on increasing the temperature, on increasing the temperature, we say solubility of gas decreases. This reaction moves in the backward direction, right? From the solution, gas and liquid, they get drifted apart. From the solution, gas gets separated, liquid gets separated. On increasing the temperature, that's why whenever you'll be having a cold drink with you, right? When you heat it up, when you heat it up, bubbles come out, carbon dioxide gas come out of it, right? That means the solubility of the gas is decreasing. It, is the ex it was the exothermic process. That's why on increasing the temperature, the reaction has moved in the backward direction due to which the gas and liquid, they got drifted apart. As simple as that. Yes? So what is going to be the correct answer of this question? It's exothermic and reversible. Option two is the one which is the correct answer of this one, my dear people. Okay? All elements of group 15 show allotropy, except <coughs> class 10th question. <laughs> First, all the elements of group 15, they show allotropy, except which one? Absolutely, you all are perfectly right. It is going to be the nitrogen, which does not show allotropy. Why is that? Why is that? Because of its less size and at the same time, because of its more electronegativity, right? So nitrogen, the only element in the group 15 which does not show allotropy, the reason is due to its low size and high electronegativity. Okay, perfect. Moving on to one more. 
Which of the following is a polysaccharide? What do you think about this one? Every one of you would be knowing this, I'm sure. Which of the following is the polysaccharide? Is glucose, maltose, glycogen, lactose? Well, I got the answer. Yes, absolutely, you're right. You're right. It is basically the glycogen, right? Glycogen is a polysaccharide. Do remember these three points as well. Do remember these three points. Glycogen is a polysaccharide, number one. It consists of highly branched polymer of glucose occurring in animal tissues. And it's also known as animal starch, right? It's also known as animal starch. Do remember these three points directly, right? These can be asked in a different form of equation as well, okay? Which one is known as the animal starch, like that? Okay, substance having lowest boiling point. I'm given with four options. You guys are going to let me know which substance among these four will have the lowest boiling point. What do you guys think about this one? What do you guys think about this one? See, hydrogen, diatomic. Oxygen, diatomic. Nitrogen, diatomic. Helium, monoatomic. Right? Helium being monoatomic and having less molar mass will have the least boiling point among all. Right? Yes. So option four, it is going to be the helium, which is going to be the correct answer of this equation. Helium is monoatomic and has low atomic mass, or you can say has, has the low molar mass among all. Yeah? <clears throat> okay. Lower, mol uh, lower molecular mass alcohols are miscible in limited amount of water. He's talking about the lower molecular mass alcohols, not the higher ones. Okay? They are miscible in limited amount of water, miscible in excess of water, Miscible in water in all proportions, immiscible in water. What do you think about this? Again, a simpler one, and I'm sure you guys are going to solve it in a proper way. It's a very simple basic equation, NCRD basic equation, right? Well, all of you have given the correct answer. Absolutely, Rishabh, absolutely, Selva, absolutely, Hari Aran, absolutely. Absolutely, it's going to be option three, right? The lower molecular mass alcohols, they are miscible in water, in all proportions because the lower members of these alcohols right they can form hydrogen bond easily with the water right and it's only the lower members of alcohols which can form easily the hydrogen bonds with water right so the lower members of alcohols the lower molecular mass alcohols they are going to be miscible in water in all proportions right so option c is the one which is going to be the correct one among all right yes perfect wonderful one more for you. Maximum oxidation state exhibited by chlorine is. What do you think about this? <clears throat> maximum oxidation state exhibited by chlorine. What is going to be the maximum oxidation state of chlorine? People, if I ask you chlorine, which group element is it? It's group 17 element. So how many electrons are, in, are there in its outermost shell? There are seven electrons, right? All halogens, they have got seven electrons in its outermost shell. So if chlorine loses all the seven electrons, it's absolutely going to show plus seven oxygen state, which is going to be its maximum oxidation state, right? So plus seven is going to be the maximum oxygen state shown by chlorine. Yeah? Okay? Perfect. Okay, section B. How much ethyl alcohol, C2H5OH, must be added to one liter of water so that the solution will freeze at minus 14 degrees centigrade? Kf is given to us. Can you try it out for me and let me know its answer? The equation is based on the depression in freezing point, quality to properties, right? As you all must be knowing, delta Tf, depression in freezing point, is equal to I, which is the Van't Hoff factor, multiplied by Kf, multiplied by molality of the solution, right? Since you are talking about ethyl alcohol, which is a non-electrolyte, and for non-electrolytes, I value is 1, right? That's something which you all must be knowing. Delta Tf, depression in freezing point, isn't it going to be freezing point of solvent minus the freezing point of solution? This is something which we call as depression freezing point is equal to Kf. Kf for solvent is given to me as 1.86 multiplied by molality. Molality means number of moles of solute. Solute is your ethyl alcohol, C2H5OH, right? Number of moles of solute divided by mass of solvent in kilograms. Mass of solvent means mass of water in kilograms. Correct? Have a look. I'm given with the volume of water. I'm given with the volume of water as one liter. Right? Volume of water is given as one liter. So what is going to be its mass? Its mass is going to be one kilogram. As simple as that. Right? Yes. Its mass is going to be one kilogram. So instead of mass of water, I'll be writing one. So 
First of all, freezing point of the solvent, freezing point of water is 0, 0 minus minus 14 comes out to be 14 is equal to 1.86 multiplied by number of moles of C2H5OH. Just solve it, get the moles of C2H5OH which you have added, right? It's going to be equal to 14 divided by 1.86, just solve it, that's going to be your answer. Right people? So what is the answer which you guys are getting from here? People are saying the answer is going to be what? Finally, the answer is going to be 7.5. Perfect. <coughs> Perfect guys, yeah, a very, very simple question this was again and you have absolutely solved it properly, wonderful. Okay, which reagents are required for one step conversion of chlorobenzene to toluene? So we are converting chlorobenzene into toluene in one step, which reagent you are going to use? Which reagent you are going to use? Yes, 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 yes Arumugam, you have to practice exactly the NCRT exemplar, absolutely. What is going to be this? Which reagent you guys are going to use for the one-step conversion of chlorobenzene to toluene? Have you heard about Wurtz-Fittig reaction? Yes? Right? Absolutely, guys. It's going to be option B, CHCl3, Na, right, in presence of ether. It is going to be the single step conversion of chlorobenzene to toluene, right? Words for reaction, we call it. Yeah? The, it, the reaction is directly given in your NCRT. That's why I'm, I keep on telling, remember the NCRT reactions, right? Mug up the NCRT reactions, right? Okay, which one of the following statement is correct about sucrose? There's something which you can solve on your own. Let me know. Let me know. Let me know fast. Which of the following statement is correct about sucrose? It can reduce Tolvin's reagent, however, cannot reduce Fallon's reagent. Is it right? We are supposed to see which of the following statement is correct. The first one is absolutely incorrect, right? First one is absolutely incorrect. It undergoes muta rotation like glucose and fractose. Is it right? No, it's again incorrect one. Okay. It undergoes inversion in configuration on hydrolysis. Yes, that's the correct one. That is the correct one. Right? We were supposed to see which one is the correct. So it's absolutely going to be option C which is the correct. It actually undergoes inversion configuration during hydrolysis, right? Yes? So option C was the one which was correct among all. Okay. One simple question, and I'm sure you all can let me know its answer properly. Phenol does not undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions easily due to what? What is the reason behind that? In case of phenol, in case of phenol, is resonance possible in phenol? Absolutely, due to resonance. Can I say the CO bond, the COH bond, which I'm talking about, right? The CO bond, that gets the partial double bond character. Due to that partial double bond character, it's difficult to break, right? Yes, so what is going to be the correct answer of this one, my dear people? It's absolutely going to be the partial double bond character of COH, right? Right, in case of phenol, there will be absolutely the partial double bond character, which increases the bond strength of CO, right? Therefore, the phenol does not undergo nucleophilic substation reaction easily, right? Due to the partial double bond character. Okay. Which of the following has the highest ionization enthalpy? Again, it's a very simple one and I'm sure you guys are going to kill it. Let me know fast. Which of the following has the highest ionization enthalpy? Is it going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sulfur? Which one? Absolutely, it's going to be nitrogen. First of all, if you talk about the nitrogen, its configuration, its outermost configuration is 2s2, 2p3, right? This phosphorus, it has got 3s2, 3p3, right? Oxygen has got 2s2, 2p4, right? Sulfur has got 3s2, 3p, 3p4, correct? These are the outermost configurations of these different elements. So first of all, you know, fully filled configurations are maximum stable, followed by half filled, followed by partially filled. Right? Among all the four elements, we have got two elements which have got half filled configuration 2p3, 3p3. Right? So, in order to take electron out from these two configurations, it's going to be difficult, right? You need to, we need to supply more energy in order to knock out the outermost electrons from these two configurations, right? Yes? But if I ask you, if I ask you, among nitrogen and phosphorus, which one will allow more ionization energy? You'll say nitrogen. No doubt. Both the ones have got half-filled configuration, but at the same time, nitrogen has got less size, right? 
Yes? Isn't it simple? Isn't it simple? Right? Selva, there is no group 17 element over here. There is no halogen over here. Yeah? Okay. Metal M ions form a cubic closed pack structure. Oxide ions occupy half octahedral and half tetrahedral whites. What is the formula of the oxide? Can you give it a try? Then only I can solve this question. I want you guys to give it a try first of all. How can I speak Tamil, bro? Okay, well, I'm not getting any answers yet. I want you guys to give it a try fast. Let me know its answer. Well, Sachin is coming up with option B. Saravana is coming up with option B. What about the rest of the people? Rishabh is coming up with D. Kaushik is coming up with B. Okay, Hema Priya is coming up with option 2. Aditya, option 4. What's in C? Azra is coming up with B. Let's try it out. Let's check it out. See, guys, let's check it out exactly. It's mentioned in the equation that we have got metal M ions, right? They are forming CCP. CCP cubic close packing means FCC, right? And there are oxide ions as well, O diregative ions as well. They are present at half of octahedral whites and half of tetrahedral whites, correct? What is going to be the formula of the compound? It's very simple. See, metal ions, they occupy what? They occupy I mean, they form FCC, face center cubic unit cell, in which the metal ions will be present at the corners and at the face centers. If you remember, what is the value of Z for FCC? That's 4. I hope you know that. Effective number of particles in FCC. Rank of face centered cubic unit cell. That's 4. So, how many total octahedral voids will be there? Whatever will be the value of Z for a unit cell, same number of, tetra same number of octahedral voids will be there. So, how many tetrahedral voids will be there? Twice of this, 4 to the 8. Total there will be four octahedral whites and total there will be eight octahedral whites. Sorry, eight tetrahedral whites, right? Metal M is forming FCC. For FCC, the value of Z is four. So instead of M, I'm writing four directly. O, o particles, these are occupying half of octahedral whites. Octahedral whites are four plus half of tetrahedral whites. These are eight, so, right? So this is going to be two plus four comes out to be six. So the ratio is going to be, this is M, this is O. The ratio is going to be four is to six. 4 is to 6 means 2 is to 3. So M2O3 is going to be the formula of the compound. So which option satisfies it? Option D. So majority of the students absolutely were perfectly correct, right? Yes, it's absolutely going to be M2O3, which is going to be the actual formula of the compound, right? Simple. So do remember, do remember whatever will be the value of Z for a unit cell. Same are going to be the number of octahedral whites in that unit cell. Twice of that is going to be the number of tetrahedral whites in that unit cell, right? That's something which I assume everyone would have taken a note of, correct? Okay, very simple and basic equation. Every one of you must answer me this one. Every one of you must answer me this one. Ozone is a dash molecule and two OO bond lines in ozone are one and one second respectively. What is going to be? What is it? What is it? Well, I can see majority of the students are giving the correct answer. That's wonderful. Good job. People, first of all, ozone, is it linear or bent? It has got the angular structure, right? Ozone has got the angular structure, first of all. So it can be option two, option four. In case of ozone, is there resonance? Absolutely, there is a resonance. So there will be equivalent structures in case of ozone. And due to those equivalent structures, all the OO bond lengths will be equal. All the OO bond lengths will be equal, right? Yes, so it's going to be angular, 128, 128, as simple as that, right? Perfect, oh guys, wonderful. Yes, absolutely, you all are right. So, due to the resonance possible in ozone, right? Both these bonds, they get the partial double bond character. Partial double bond character means that bond lengths will be same, bond strengths will be same, as simple as that. Okay, water retention or puffiness due to high salt intake occurs due to. This happens in the common life, day-to-day -day life as well. It is due to what? What is the reason behind this? Isn't osmosis the reason behind this? What do you think? 
Well, I'm looking at your charts, my dear people. Absolutely, you all are perfectly right. It's absolutely going to be the osmosis. It's absolutely going to be the osmosis. Yes? Perfectly done, guys. Exactly. So do remember a few statements. People taking a lot of salt or salty food experience water retention in tissue cells and intercellular spaces due to osmosis. This results in puffiness and swelling is called okay, swelling is called as endema. Do remember this point as well. It can be asked in the form of one more MCQ, right? This results in puffiness and this puffiness or sp uh, swelling is something which we call as edema, okay? All right, which one of the following are correctly arranged on the basis of the property indicated? You need to see exactly which one of the following are correctly are correctly arranged on the base of what? On the base of their property indicated. What do you think about this one? What do you think about this one? My dear people, fast. Let me know fast. And the ones who have not liked the video yet, please do like the video, share the video with your friends and do subscribe to the channel as well. I'll tell you one simple thing. See, if I look at the last one, these are the hydrides of group 15, right? These are the hydrides of group 15. Yes? You're starting with NH3. You've got PH3. You've got ASH3. You've got SBH3. You've got BIH3. These are the hydrides of your group 15 elements, right? Okay. Is the hybridization of every hydride same? Yes, hybridization of every Hydride is same, right? NH3, nitrogen is sp3 hybridized, pH3, phosphorus is sp3 hybridized, hydrogen is same. Okay. Is the terminal atom same everywhere? Terminal atoms are same again everywhere, right? Do remember when the hybridization of these hydrides will be same? When the terminal atoms will be same? At that point of time, do remember in short, bond angle is directly proportional to electronegativity of the central atom. Is directly proportional to electronegativity of the central atom. Wherever central atom is going to be maximum electronegative, there only you will find the bond angle maximum. So, and in case of NH3, the bond angle will be maximum followed by PH3, followed by ASH3, followed by SBH3, followed by BH3. So, there is only one option which I could see over here, which is basically correct, which is absolutely correct, right? It's absolutely going to be option D, right? And all the other, all the other things which are given to us, those are not the correct forms, right? This sequence is given. The dissociation energy, acidic strength, increasing oxygen state, no way. These are not the answers. It's absolutely going to be option D, right? Okay. Perfect. All right. Identify the secondary alcohols from the following set of molecules. We are given the set of molecules. Let me know which all are secondary among them. Which all are, way do you see? Which all are secondary alcohols among them, my dear people? Fast. Fast, fast, fast. Fast. I want answers in the charts. I'm looking at your charts only. Fast. See guys, well I can see a lot of people are coming with option 1, option B. Option 1 and option B, is that? So let's check it out, is it option 1 and option D? Let's check it out. First of all, if you look at this compound, it is CH3 basically, it's like this. It is like the CH3, it is CH2, this is CH, with this CH you have got OH attached and over here you have got CH3, correct? So first of all, the carbon with which OH is attached, the carbon with which OH is attached, for this carbon, on its both sides, you have got carbons attached. On its both sides, you have got carbons attached. It's absolutely going to be the 2 degree carbon. So it's going to be the 2 degree alcohol, right? It is the example of the 2, two degree alcohol. This is COH, COH, and with this carbon, you have got 3 C2H5 groups. This is C2H5, this is C2H5, this is C2H5, right? First of all, this is the carbon with which OH is attached and this carbon has got on three sides of it, other carbon atoms are, other groups containing carbon are added, right? So is it two degree or three degree? It's a three degree carbon, right? 
It is phenol. It's not the alcohol. This is phenol. This is not the alcohol, right? Maudrabi, this is this is phenol. This is not alcohol. Alcohol is different than phenol, right? Okay. What about this one? What about this one? If you talk about this carbon, if you talk about this carbon, on two sides of it, you have got the carbon atoms attached, right? So it's again going to be secondary. So which all are secondary? First one is secondary, fourth one is secondary. This one is not secondary, it's three degree. This is phenol. I've got nothing to do with this. So one and four. Where do we see one and four? Option one. So option one is going to be the correct one among all, right? Right, my dear people, the ones who have not liked the video, please do like the video, share the video with your friends, and do subscribe to the channel as well. One more for you. Let me know fast. A very simple question, which is NCRD based. Kill it. Fast. Al alkenes decolorize bromine water in presence of Cl CCL4 due to the formation of. It's a very common reaction, guys. Do you get geminal dihalide or vicinal dihalide in this? Do you get geminal or vicinal dihalide in this? Absolutely. Rishab gave the answer. Kaushik gave the answer. Wonderful. Selva gave the answer. Krishna, phenol is not alcohol. Phenol is different. Absolutely. You will be getting the vicinal dibromide. Dihalide means dibromide because you are using Br2, right? And this is the reaction. You are starting with ethene with Br2, right? Your, this halogen bromine, it's getting attached with the two adjacent carbon atoms, right? So you are getting the vicinal dibromide over here. Right? So basically alkenes, they alkenes, they decolorize bromine water in presence of CCL4 due to the formation of what? Due to the formation of vicinal dihalide. I mean the vicinal dibromide, right? Okay. Associate reason question. You guys can let me know its answer again. This for you. Let me know fast in the chats, my dear people. I want answers from every single guy of you. Let me know fast. Assertion A. Electron gain enthalpy of oxygen is less than that of fluorine, but greater than that of nitrogen. Is it correct? Is it correct? What do you think? What do you think? I'm asking you. Electron gain enthalpy of oxygen is less than that of fluorine, but greater than that of nitrogen. It's correct, right? It's correct. On moving from left to right, what happens to electron gain enthalpy? It increases. On moving from left to right, generally it increases. Yes? If you talk about the reason, ionization enthalpy of elements follows the order. Nitrogen, no doubt, it has got more ionization energy than that of, than that of oxygen. Right? But does nitrogen have more ionization energy than that of fluorine? Does it happen? What do you think about the reason? Is the reason correct? Is the reason correct? No way. A is true. First one is true. On moving from left to right, electron gain enthalpy increases, right? Yes. That's why oxygen will be having more electron gain enthalpy than that of nitrogen and will be having less electron gain enthalpy than that of what? Than that of fluorine, right? But at the same time, if you talk about the reason, ionization enthalpy of nitrogen will be definitely more than that of oxygen, but it's absolutely going to be less than that of fluorine, right? Group 17 elements, they have got more ionization energy than that of group 15 elements in general, right? Yes? Perfect. One more for you. Let me know its answer in the charts. Let me know its answer in the charts. Again, the assertion reason question, my dear people. Alli alkyl halides are insoluble in water. Absolutely right. Yes? Absolutely, alkyl halides are insoluble in water. Reason is given. Alkyl halides have... Halogen attached to sp3 hybrid carbon. Is this the correct reason? Is this the correct reason? What do you think? See, assertion is right. Absolutely, alkyl halides, they are insoluble in water. Right? But is the reason correct? The reason is not correct. Is it the correct reason? It is not the correct reason. It is not the correct reason. But the statement is true. Statement is true, absolutely, right? But the reason is not correct. What is the actual reason? Why your alkyl halides are insoluble in water? Because in your alkyl halides, there are already there is already the hydrogen bonding present. It is difficult to break the, the pre-existing hydrogen bonding. Right? In case of alkyl halides, already there is hydrogen bonding. When you put it into water, right? when you put it into water, it is difficult to read, uh, it, it is difficult to break the already made hydrogen bonding. Right? Yes? Perfect. So you can have a look. Alkyl halides are insoluble in water because they are unable to form hydrogen bonds with water or, 
or they are unable to break pre-existing hydrogen bonds, right? They are unable to break pre-existing hydrogen bonds. One is true, second is true, but second is not the correct reason for the first one. Yeah? Perfect. Okay, one more question. This is something which you can kill on your own, I'm sure. Let me know fast in the chats. Molarity of a solution changes with temperature. Is that right? Molarity depends on volume. Volume depends on temperature. So molarity depends on temperature. It's, it's something which you discuss in your class 11th as well, right? Molarity is temperature dependent. But have you studied anywhere as the molarity as the Collegiate property? Is molarity the Collegiate property, my dear people? Is molarity the Collegiate property? What do you think? Molarity is not the Collegiate property, right? Yes? Which all Collegiate property do you study in your chemistry? You start with the relative loading in vapor pressure. Then you talk about the elevation boiling point, depression freezing point, osmotic pressure. These are the only four collective property which you deal with in your solution chapter, right? Have you ever seen a molarity mentioned over here as a collective property? Molarity is not the collective property, okay? Molarity depends on temperature. Molarity changes. Molarity of the solution changes on changing the temperature. But it is not the collective property. So A is true, but assertion is true, but reason is false, right? Perfectly done. This is one more question. Crioscopic constant, KF, KF, crioscopic constant, right? Molal depression constant, depends on the nature of solvent. Absolutely, it's right, right? Yes, crioscopic constant, KF, it actually depends on the nature of the solvent. Crioscopic constant is a universal constant. Have you ever seen this kind of a statement written in your books that crioscopic constant is a universal constant, right? We already, we, we just know one thing, R, gas constant, that is basically the universal constant, right? Universal gas constant. Have you ever heard crioscopic constant is a universal constant? No way. First one is true, but reason is wrong. A is true, but R is false, yeah? Right? Perfect. Okay, match the following, match the following. Amino acids, amino acids, amino acids, they form what? They form proteins, right? Yes? Is that? What is going to be the answer of this question, guys? And they form what? They form zoetrione. Yeah? Perfect. So you are going to attach amino acids with zoetrione. So one you are going to attach with D. One with A, one with D, one with D. So either two or three. Thymine. Thymine. Nitrogenous base in DNA. Right? Thymine. Second, you are going to attach with C. Second, you're attaching with C. So just you got the answer, it's option two. No need to check the rest. No need to check the rest, right? It's option two. Option two is satisfying all the parameters. No other option is satisfying the same, right? Okay, it's absolutely option two. So amino acids, they form proteins and exist as zoetrines. Thymine is a nitrogenous base in DNA. Insulin is a protein. Uh, phosphodiester linkage is found in nucleo, I mean nucleic acids, so also in DNA, and uracil is nitrogenous base found in RNA, which is a nucleic acid. Perfect. Which of the following analogies is correct? Give it a try, let me know its answer. Again, a simple one. Which of the following analogies is correct? C. Is this the correct configuration of nitrogen? Yes, this is the correct configuration of nitrogen. Argon. Is this the correct electronic configuration of argon? What do you think? No. This configuration is for neon, right? This is for neon. So this is not the correct one. Carbon, maximum compounds, right? Xenon, no compounds. What? What about XCF2? What about XCF4? What about XCF6? XCF2 linear. XCF2 linear. If you talk about XCF2, if you talk about XCF2, you have got two sigma bonds and there are through three lone pairs. There are three lone pairs on this xenon, right? Which absolutely makes it linear, right? This is for example xenon. There will be three lone pairs like this on the equatorial plane, right? One fluorine above the plane, one fluorine down the plane. Down the plane. Just, just omit, ignore these lone pairs. It's absolutely linear. This one is correct. But if you talk about CLF3, is it trigonal planar? CLF3. Three sigma bonds, two lone pairs. Three sigma bonds, two lone pairs, right? Three sigma bonds, two lone pairs. These are the two lone pairs. This is your chlorine, right? This is one fluorine, 
one floor in perpendicular upwards, one floor in perpendicular downwards, right? So omit this, it is actually T-shaped, right? It's actually T-shaped. Is it trigonal planar? No way, it cannot be the answer. Helium, meteorological observations, absolutely correct. Argon, metallurgical processes, absolutely correct. Option four is the one that's correct, right? All the other options, we canceled them in the beginning itself. So there was only one option left, that was option four, right? Okay, complete the following. A simpler one. Kill it. Fast. Kill it. Kill it fast. Complete the following analogy. Same molecular formula. That means isomers, right? Same molecular formula, but different structures. Perfect. non super imposable mirror image in anchomers, right? So option one is going to be the correct one only. Option one is the correct one only. No need to check the rest of the things, right? Same molecular formula, but different structures. Absolutely the isomers. Non superimposable mirror, uh, mirror image, these are going to be the enantiomers, right? So we will, with this, your first mock test of chemistry is over. Well, tomorrow or day after tomorrow, I'm, I'll be coming up with the second mock test for the CBSE term one, right? And right after the exam, I'll be solving, just after your exam, I'll be actually solving your chemistry paper over here on this channel itself. You can check it out. Uh, I mean, the answer can everything right after the exam, okay? And if you have not, join the J2020 program yet, you can join it still, okay? These are the three plans. Links are there in the description box of the video. Do check any one of these links. Try it out, there is a link in the description box of the video, that's for the Telegram. Do click on this link as well. Get added to the Telegram group and stay updated with the classes. And for uh, let me show you exactly how to get enrolled into the batch for the J2022, which is going to start on the actual within the platform. This is the video which you guys are currently watching you need to click on this show more, right? After clicking on this, you'll be getting a lot of links. J crash course has started. Crash course, right? Two and a half months crash course, your entire syllabus gets done and dusted in all the three subjects, right? Do, as per my op opinion, do take this crash course. It's going to be absolutely helpful for you. You can anyways try it out for 15 days as well. I don't know why it's not opening. Just a second. I'll open it again, okay. Right? You need to choose your plan, light or classic, right? Okay, you are just getting this plan for 10,000. It was supposed to be for 20,000, but there's a 50% off going on. You can buy the course, you can use the coupon code, right? You can the, use the coupon code WBJCC, buy complete course, and give your number, email ID on which you'll be getting the OTP and everything, and eventually, you get enrolled into the crash course batch. Do get enrolled in it as soon as possible, it's going to be highly beneficial for you, right? So it was nice meeting you, my dear people. I'll see you guys day after tomorrow. Till then, you guys take care. Bye-bye. God bless you all. I love you all. Take care, guys. Bye.